I'm going to give a, a quick, brief, very brief introduction, and then I'll turn it over to Sebastian. But uh, for those of you who don't know, Sebastian uh, Schmidt is joining us from University of Colorado, uh, also part of LASP uh, at University of Colorado. And he is uh, works on atmospheric remote sensing, radiative energy budget studies using aircraft, space, or ground-based data, specifically focusing on spectral resolve measurements in the shortwave and 3D radiative transfer. I know Sebastian from our work with uh, the, uh, well, Arise Fuel campaign back in 2014 now, and also then the writing of the ARC-6 white paper, uh, which uh, is a campaign that uh, Sebastian will share with us more details on today that uh, has recently been competed and instruments and team members have been selected and this is a campaign that I'm sure he'll mention is is slated anyway to to go to Greenland uh, in 2024 uh, late spring early summer 2024 so with that so so this one just I guess uh, this is the first one of these uh, webinars that we've had in a little while but you know we're here to to hear about the field campaign uh, understand you know what the uh, the the process of, of the of the field campaign that the, the objectives and try to help us learn more about, uh, you know, the process of these to both, you know, inform our panel deliberations as well as, you know, maybe pass on some best practices that we've learned from reviewing a lot of these field campaigns to other field campaigns. So with that, I will turn it over to Sebastian and uh, Sebastian, since I am pretty sure you're the only one we, we don't have, this is something we can have for discussion. We don't tech typically have a modern don't officially have like a modeler, I don't think, as part of the team necessarily. Certainly, so, you know, Sebastian, you have like the full kind of time here up until 2.30, so I'll give you a warning. And if you go short, that's fine too. <laughs> yeah, so I can also try to take a little bit less. So that would be uh, about 20 minutes, I would say, or so I'll try to shoot for that. Um, 20 minutes is perfect. Thank yeah, you. so let's see. Um, can you all see the full slide here? Perfect. Okay, so I wanna thank you for the invitation and also Patrick, uh, generally, I wanted to thank you specifically um, for all of your work contributing to ARC-6. So as Patrick just mentioned, um, we were co-conspirators for the white paper which was very, very long um, in the works, several years. And um, Patrick traveled here to Boulder, and I'm not in that office right now, where, uh, but we developed all of these flight plans and ideas on my whiteboard, and uh, Patrick brought some beer. It was really exciting, great times. So now the mission did indeed go into roses. And uh, as Patrick just said, the science team uh, has been selected. Um, Hal Mehring is actually just in the process of, you know, we, um, sending the first email to the science team. So uh, my apologies if I'm not giving you um, the view of the mission as it is alive, but still the mission as it is under development. That's just because of the timing so with that, let me actually go to uh, some things that did happen already. Uh, and I call this here the context uh, of ARC-6. Um, the context of ARC-6 is, of course, to view it in the development of uh, prior missions. And I will show shortly a chart with missions over the past 20 years or so. But what I'm showing here is the most recent event um, in terms of uh, Arc uh, Arctic remote sensing and in situ sensing. I participated in the spring in a mission that was based in Kiruna, northern Sweden. And it was developed by my close German colleagues. Um, Manfred Wendisch is the overall PI on this one. It's called AC3. And it's actually more so than ARC-6, it's, it's more a climate project. It involves a lot of modeling and it's geared towards uh, the better understanding of Arctic amplification. Uh, they have a lot of collaborators there, but piece of that are also various different aircraft campaigns um, based in Svalbard, northeastern Greenland and Sweden. So this one was really great to be part of. 
what that campaign specifically looked at was at um, uh, basically warm air intrusions and um, cold air outbreaks in the springtime. Uh, there is a paper that just came out in BAMS uh, about this, and you can also go to this German website here to look at this. Um, it was interesting because so I was in that campaign and I was dropping drop sons from uh, one of the planes that you can see here. And we were fortunate in that um, the, uh, this time in the spring, so March 15th, that was actually, we had a lot of these warm air intrusions happening. It was one of the, you know, most significant events in a long time, uh, to the point that several newspapers published on this. So this here is a screenshot from the Washington Post. And uh, on the right hand side is a tweet uh, by the flight planners. And it also shows you a little bit of a it gives you a glimpse on how we were working. This is actually one of their flight planning tools where they're putting uh, the icon or the ECMWF model into, they're, they're projecting that onto a map here, but not just horizontally, but you can essentially fly through these forecasting fields and you can construct the aircraft track as is shown here in blue, such that they basically cross over that warm air um, corridor there in numerous locations, drop drop zones, etc. Um, and then that's the flight plan that is then pursued and then later on looked at and, you know, the forecast is evaluated and all of that. So that just gives you a taste of this. The, the Germans and uh, Patrick and I and others, we actually developed some of this uh, in, in close collaboration with them. So I'm getting. Uh, still, uh, yes. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, I I don't see a full screen. I do see you have a background uh, PowerPoint. Um, do you? Uh, do others have the same problem? Yes. Do you, do you see? Uh, do you see uh, this this screenshot with uh, the now, Washington now Post? Now it's better. Now now you. Uh, <laughs> oh okay. Okay. You see, okay, so for some reason WebEx shared my full screen then. Okay, let me just make it as big as I possibly yeah, can. Now, now it's better. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, Thank and you. now do you now see the list of prior field missions? Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. So uh, I'm starting with Shiba, which I'm sure um, all of you know, it's not the first mission in the Arctic, but the reason it's mentioned here was because it essentially happened pre-EOS. EOS was just about to be launched. And therefore, uh, so even though it's a ship-based mission, of course, um, it, it sort of ushered in this, this new era of um, you know, Earth observations. Some of the algorithms uh, that are still used to date um, were actually developed based on the Shiba data set and then also FireRace. Uh, so FireRace was a a NASA campaign um, and these 98 measurements, they really formed the basis of some of these algorithms that are still applied to MODIS today. Um, I'm sort of highlighting a few other missions here. You can read this for yourselves, um, what these others are, but I'm highlighting some in red here uh, because so the, the next one here, the next NASA campaign anyway is Arctas where which was um, mostly dedicated to understanding um, aerosol radiative effects in the arctic so over bright surfaces that was in 2008 and then patrick just mentioned the arise mission which was done with leftover funds essentially uh, at some point to uh, understand the um, role of radiation in the surface melt at the time of the uh, sea ice maximum in, in september um, I mentioned ARISE specifically because um, our mission, ARCSIX, owes a lot of heritage to that. Um, then in gray down here is the Mosaic mission, which I'm sure you also all know, which is the next big uh, drifting mission after Shiva, essentially. And then there's this Halo AC3 campaign that I just mentioned that I attended this spring. Um, so. Now, actually, to ARC-6, this is the title page of the white paper, which you can download at ESPO. As you can see who the writing team is here, Patrick um, and Lynette are 
the most important co-authors, I would say. Um, what is ARC-6, um, just in a few words? So the, the details here are, uh, we're gonna be sitting in Thule in Northwestern Greenland. It's an Air Force, uh, now Space Force based um, a base. Um, and um, we're gonna be sitting there in from May through July with two airplanes. And it's gonna be split into two campaigns that are three weeks each. So the science teams are gonna fly home uh, in between. And the reason is to um, have two different sample points, three week long sam sample points at different stages of the ice evolution, uh, evolution in the area. Uh, the flyers that we're talking about are two planes. So it's the NASA P3 as the low flyer from Wallops uh, they carry in situ instrumentation and some remote sensing, and then the NASA Langley um, G3 as the high flyer carrying some remote sensing. And Patrick and I and Jens Redeman also, we made the point early on when developing this mission that it needed to be a two aircraft mission um, because it being NASA centric, we really wanted to emphasize um, the development of the next generation remote sensing capabilities for the Arctic, while also fostering the science questions that I will bring up on the next slide. So um, locations, it's still a little bit up in the air. Um, of course, it's uh, primarily Thule as the base, but we're considering to also use Svalbard as a so-called suitcase uh, location, meaning we would fly over there crossing and sampling the Fram Strait, but then land there uh, to maximize sampling time on the way back. There is even now the new possibility of uh, stationing, of having one station at the so-called station north, uh, uh, northeast of Greenland. Patrick, I think even you don't know that yet, uh, but that's a possibility. And this is not just supported by the radiation science program, but also the cryospheric program. So Torsten Marcus is chipping in some funding and um, also instrumentation. Uh, so NASA Goddard is contributing um, the Elvis um, LIDAR, which is wonderful. Um, so I already told you that the science team selections uh, have now been made. The first science team meeting is probably gonna happen in July. And I'm, we don't know yet where, you know, Hal Mering has floated the idea of doing it at JPL maybe, but I think it's actually gonna happen in in DC uh, because uh, this is basically where most of the people are. Um, we have a few gathered people, etc. So to be decided, but uh, people are invited, of course, to come to that and contribute and participate. Uh, so the overarching questions um, are mentioned here, but I have another slide where this is given in more detail. Um, so this is what I would call ARC-6 in one slide. Some of these things I already told you about. I think there is a, okay. Um, <clears throat> I I guess there's, like a, there's a hot mic there somewhere. Okay, now I'm muted. So this is the objective here. Uh, I already told you it's to quantify uh, the contributions of clouds, aerosols, and precipitation to the Arctic summer surface radiation budget, but more importantly, the sea ice melt um, in this region north of Greenland um, towards the pole over in the Fram Strait. Um, specifics are given here in those regions. Timing, I already told you about. Platforms. Um, so I can skip to the next slide here and show you the more specific science questions now. So I should tell you, so there are four pieces here and those were added gradually. So initially this really was just a radiation mission with uh, this overarching objective. And that came out of um, ARISE. The, the background was that a lot of missions had been conducted such as um, um, you know, the, the early missions, you know, starting with Sheba, um, that, that, uh, emphasized processes, um, you know, cloud aerosol surface interaction processes, but not a lot of missions had been dedicated to studying the impact of, of radiation on these, on these melt processes. And so that's where we were initially coming from, uh, for, for Arise. 
And so these were the initial science questions, but later on, um, we added what we would call the process questions, the cloud lifecycle uh, questions. So you can't just study um, cloud radiative effects and aerosol radiative effects uh, divorced from uh, the cloud evolution. Uh, and so this is what is shown on the right-hand side here. So we're asking um, what processes actually uh, drive the cloud evolution. What are we missing? Why are clouds surviving, not surviving? Why do we have these thin clouds all of a sudden in this area? And very importantly, what feeds these clouds? You know, do they live from uh, uh, ice uh, nuclei that are local production or are they advected from the lower latitudes? Where does the water vapor come from? You know, is it in these reservoirs above those clouds or is there coupling with the surface? Those are the kinds of questions that drove us in lots of discussions which I can't possibly summarize here, but this is the uh, this is the 20 kilometer overview here. Um, then, since this is NASA, there is a strong remote sensing objective. So, as you all know, the remote sensing um, is probably the least well developed in the Arctic. Uh, the biggest uh, gaping hole is that we don't have an operational surface reflectance product in the Arctic. Um, so there's some of you might know the MCD 43, maybe that's just um, uh, in existence uh, in the lower latitudes, um, no such thing in the higher latitudes. So we know very little about surface reflectance alone, let alone have good uh, passive um, imagery based remote sensing. We used to have some active remote sensing with Calypso, but you know, Calypso is almost dead, plus it has the infamous pole hole, so there were never observations very much north of uh, the northern coast of Greenland. So one of the big driving objectives is really to elevate this sort of remote sensing using the aircraft observations. And then the last addition is shown here on the left-hand side, it's the sea ice, the cryospheric aspect where we really emphasize the interactions between the atmosphere and the cryosphere. Uh, one of the underlying questions that is maybe not so obvious here is um, our goal to eventually be able to do seasonal sea ice um, prediction better. Uh, so there was a lot of conversation going on there. Some of it is going to be driven by um, better better proxies, et cetera, that can be used for, for such things. Um, let me show you the area a little bit here. Um, so you see Greenland there, Thule here on the western side. Station Nord is about here where I'm circling and then Svalbard is there. So we're talking about this triangle here that we're gonna be sampling, <coughs> which, which is one of the least sampled areas of the Arctic. So we have been over here in Fairbanks and the Beaufort Sea quite a bit. Uh, over there, the Fram Strait itself was uh, sampled extensively by the Germans and now also the UK and the French people. But um, up here, there is relatively little. Of course, that's one of the areas where um, Mosaic was going. Initially, by the way, we wanted to measure together with Mosaic, but that tells you something about the timeline with which such missions are developed. We're several years, going to be several years late. Um, so about the, a little bit about the implementation, what are we gonna be carrying on these planes? I wish, uh, this is actually still from a talk that Patrick Lynette and I gave uh, a while ago uh, at a different uh, uh, venue. And um, I wish I could give you some more of the details because we now know some of them, we know which instruments we're flying. But just a high level overview here. So the G3 is going to be carrying drop zones. Um, it's going to be carrying an imager, more specifically Avers and G, hopefully with uh, Steve Platnick um, helping us with their heritage retrievals. Uh, but Avers uh, itself brings some cryospheric remote sensing. Um, there's also going to be the Langley Halo um, water vapor cloud and aerosol LIDAR, which is wonderful because it gives us um, uh, a lot of uh, information about the vertical structure uh, and even potentially some some uh, 
cloud retrievals, et cetera. You know, we're going to get cloud boundaries mount and phase. Um, so then that low flyer is a mix of in situ instrumentation to characterize aerosol properties, um, cloud size distribution. Uh, it's going to make a composition measurements. Um, uh, we're going to get the standard meteorology measurements. Um, yeah, this is the cloud microphysics. This is not internal to the plane, but these are, of course, going to be wing probes. Uh, then um, we're going to measure some gases, some tracer gases, of course, radiation. And um, we're going to get um, some remote sensing as well. Um, so the remote sensing right now is going to be a Raman LIDAR that um, measures the um, it's essentially a, almost like a flying drop sound where we're flying curtains uh, like a, a LIDAR, but we are getting the temperature profile and the water vapor profile underneath us. This is in addition, of course, to the halo LIDAR on the high flyer, which gives us uh, the water vapor, um, the water vapor mixing ratio. So that's that. That's the Raman LIDAR. In, um, we are going to get a microwave radiometer pointing up, uh, which gets us um, water vapor column amount, uh, liquid water, um, so the condensate uh, above us. We are still trying, so this is a touchy subject, we are still trying to get a radar, um, uh, precipitation and cloud radar if possible. I cannot give you any information at this point. Um, to be absolutely honest, this is the a uh, gaping hole of the payload, because in the requirements table per the white paper, this was a priority one um, instrument. Uh, the problem is that you can never predict what proposals you will get in. Um, we are, however, fortunate, so this is now the uh, last remote sensing instrument that I'm going to mention, to get the Elvis LIDAR on the low flyer as well. Uh, so that will be complemented, of course, by satellite observations. I've just reached out to people also at the surface, the people at um, Station Nord. There's a Danish observatory that we're going to be um, collaborating with. There are observations in Svalbard, and then there are observations in Canada. We have to yet make this contact with them. And there are observations in Thule um, uh, directly. Uh, so they're made by the Italians. One of their students is actually just visiting with me here in, in Boulder. So we're talking about strategy, uh, instruments, etc. cetera. Um, I better accelerate a little bit here to uh, show you some of this stuff here. It, I would recommend that if you're interested in the predecessor campaign to ARC-6 Arise, that you maybe take a glance of this paper by Bill Smith, um, at, at Langley. This is a BAMS paper. The link is here. And in addition uh, to drawing heritage from that ARISE campaign in 2014, uh, we also benefited from, an, from EVS proposals that um, both Patrick submitted at Langley and also we submitted here at CU with um, Walid, um, Abdalati, and others. Um, so that's kind of the heritage. Um, one of the uh, ideas of uh, Arise was actually to um, compare what the series uh, data set, you know, with the help of MODIS, of course, is telling us about um, both the top of uh, atmosphere uh, and the surface uh, radiation budget, radiative effects of clouds. I'm not going to go into uh, detail here with these plots. I believe that Patrick is making this into uh, a paper now, or it might have even come out already. But the idea here was to um, do a statistical sampling in one of these one, 100 by 100 uh, or larger grid boxes here and do an evaluation um, statistically of the fluxes that we're getting from satellite versus from aircraft. But what we also did on what we called these lawnmower patterns here was we either overflew or underflew these cloud banks here. And then we compared what we're getting from remote sensing on the one hand with in situ um, measurements um, at the aircraft. And the most important thing that came out of that was the discovery that um, there are lots of these thin clouds that um, hang out there on a regular basis that are not identified or detected, let alone characterized by satellites. 
turns out about a third of the clouds are not detected by passive imagery. Um, uh, so we're not the only ones who who found that. And of course, if you think about that, then you go, hey, you know, if we don't detect these clouds, then, you know, this is a big deal because they have a, a, a large radiative effect in the in the IR and they can contribute to melting. Uh, they were actually the major suspect uh, that led to this 2012 melt event in Greenland that was published on by Bernard. So this is basically the equivalent of that over the Arctic Ocean. Let me skip over this. So um, that um, we, I'm, Patrick, with your permission, I'm even going to skip over the cloud life cycle and sea ice properties so we have more time for discussion because I don't want to drone yeah, on here. Um, and um, even, even the new remote sensing stuff here, and I, I just did want to show you another example here of how the planning actually happens. Um, so we did do what's called dry runs. We used the German tools that they used for AC3, but applied them to uh, to our uh, situations. And we said, okay, you know, what would we do if the situation is like this? And we have, <clears throat> maybe this is a little different from prior campaigns. It often happens that when you have a lot of objectives, uh, people will essentially start arguing when they're in the field, what are we going to fly now? No, this is my favorite sampling situation. What Patrick and I did instead here was we said, we're going to establish a sampling priority table, which we're going to use in a decision tree kind of manner and say, this is what we're encountering now. Um, and this is what we have on our, what we would call scorecard that we already flew. So if we see one of these rare conditions where, for example, we have clear sky in the high Arctic, um, then we're going to go and measure the surface reflectance. Whereas if we have transport from the lower latitudes that comes with a lot of aerosols, we're going to sample that and we're going to fly across the Fram Strait um, to get that. So this is how we sort of uh, structured our dry run exercise already. And we're in the process of refining um, these tools. And of course, also the priority table now that the science team has been fully selected. And with that, uh, I'm actually right at um, 2.31, and I think I can technically open this up for discussion and questions, but I also wanted to share these other pictures with, here, uh, with you here. So this is taken from the plane. These are these wonderful northern lights here on the right-hand side. Uh, there's a halo here, an actual halo, and I'm going to go right back to this slide here to take um, your questions. So thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, does anybody have questions? I'm going to try not to ask too many questions since I was kind of involved, but I may have some as we move on here, Sebastian, but who would like to open it up? Yeah, I Regina? actually, yeah, maybe uh, it's maybe a very naive question, but uh, uh, so, um, how often do you fly the plane? So you, you kind of circle again on the same area. So what is the sampling strategies with the planes? Yeah, I skipped a very good question, actually, not naive at all. It's um, so the there are various different elements here, but one of the important ones is to learn from what uh, Operation Icebridge did in the past. Um, where they're essentially revisiting key areas that they've uh, previously identified. Um, for example, um, if we're interested in the sea ice characteristics and how the sea ice um, properties are changing over time, we better revisit that. So we had the idea, for example, that we have a baseline characterization of certain spots here. If you see me circle here somewhere, let's say, no, just north of Greenland, you often have the development of these melt ponds. Um, they also go further north, but this is where they first show up. And so you want to have some samples of these melt ponds. You want to have some samples of certain flows that are going around in a marginal ice zone and, um, you know, eventually drifting out of the Fram Strait. But you want to revisit them after, say, precipitation events. You might have a snow event or you might have uh, rain. We encountered that often in AC3, actual rain over the ice. And so the idea is to basically tag uh, these locations that we visited um, in terms of the snow properties and ice properties from Elvis plus, you know, 
the albedo and reflectance, and then uh, track their path over the course of the mission. So stay focused on them, know where they are, and then go back there again. There is also another region that we think of uh, sampling over time again, and that is the Fram Strait itself, if we get a chance to do that, because we have the in situ measurement anchor points right here and right there. So we then fill in the rest in between to understand some of these processes as they play out over time. So when we have transport events, for example, then we want to follow them over, say, you know, the time that they play out over the course of, you know, 24 hours or maybe one and a half days or so. That was a long winded answer, but it was also a very yeah. important question. Yeah, no, that's very, that's very good. Thank you so much. I think I. I appreciate, I think, also discussing these melt points because they um, are small features, but they can have a big impact on the albedo, correct? Absolutely. And not only that, but they, these melt points, they also um, have a major impact on the evolution or the fate of the ice in that region. Um, and they also happen to be the next frontier of remote sensing in the area. So back when we first developed the mission, um sensors such as sentinel etc they were on the horizon but they weren't in in use and now when you go to presentations everybody talks about the high spatial resolution observations of these melt ponds um, and their characterization and they do machine learning all of these things because they are so incredibly important so there's a lot going on there thank you yeah, melt ponds were a really key consideration in, in those return flights to really track how they're influencing the surface energy budget in the region. All right, I think guys, I'll hi long. You have a hand up. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sebastian. Very nice and uh, sounds like a very comprehensive field campaign to understand the uh, those all those processes in the Arctic. Uh, so I I particularly uh, interesting to see that your emphasis on the two way interaction. Uh, between the sea ice and uh, atmosphere. So in terms of the sampling strategy, what, is there any uh, particular strategy will be used to understand the two-way uh, interaction rather than just get the, uh, you have like pretty long, uh, three weeks uh, within, uh, six six weeks within the uh, three, three months. So uh, it's not, you're not going to just get some statistics. You you, you focus right. on the processes. What 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 particular uh, sampling strategy to to tackle the two way uh, interactions? You, you yeah. mentioned your pond, but you probably have other. Right. So so the, I appreciate the question, and there is actually a lot in that one. Uh, uh, so let me start with the term comprehensive. Um, yes. We were striving to be comprehensive, but um, first of all, unfortunately, we're not entirely comprehensive with the payload because we're still lacking some instruments. We, you know, it would have been nicer to have some more complete instrumentation. Uh, I do hope we're still going to get the radar. That's really, you know, a high priority for me. Um, there are some other instruments that are we're still you know, struggling for. So the other piece is comprehensive in terms of uh, sampling. So if you go after these interactions, you know, the, the, the challenging question would be right away, well, while the Arctic is a big place, how can you possibly have a statistically significant sample of those interactions? Um, and the answer that, to that is, not so simple, but what we were, our approach right now is certainly debatable, certainly debatable, is what we call the regime based approach. And let me give you an example for this, which is somewhere hidden in my slides up here. Uh, of what I actually mean by and now apologies, I'm going to radiative regimes. Now I'm not getting to let's say cryosphere atmosphere interactions. But just to illustrate this, we look at this, uh, in this case, say two dimensional parameter space here where the surface albedo is on the X axis and um, the uh, irradiances are on the Y axis here. Those happen to be the net irradiances. And 
all of this is parameter space where the system lives. And um, you see that there are blobs in this parameter space where the system, you know, lives preferentially. And you could argue that for understanding, at least in the radiative realm, the system, um, you need to focus on those blobs in the parameter space, and you need to maybe revisit those four blobs um, occasionally, um, or as often as you can, and focus on those rather than spreading yourself too thinly in the six mission, uh, the six weeks that you have available. But now getting to the next piece of your question, if you're after processes, then this is not enough because this is just monitoring and mapping. There is this nice paper by Morrison in 2012 where he essentially looked at the trajectory between these blobs here. I don't know if you remember that one, Hai Long, but yeah. it, you know, the paper has been criticized a lot since then. But in essence, the idea to understand the topography of parameter space with respect to different uh, pieces of the system, the topography on the one hand, and then the trajectories that live on that topography that are associated with these processes, that is the underlying philosophy of that mission, I would say. And that's how we try to tackle this big problem that you mentioned, that we're not going to be able to get enough measurements. Now, is it going to work for the three-way interaction? I don't know. We have to develop that more and flesh that out more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you do have two more years to plan for it. <laughs> yeah, Almost. year and a half. <laughs> year and a half. <laughs> uh, right. Um, so, but certainly it's not just going to be a statistical, you know, mapping. That's that's useless. Of course, we have to do that in the context of of the models. And I should have shown a nice example here uh, that came out of AC3. We're actually learning a lot from how they do it. They're really, um, you know, for example, the icon model did a very bad job at, um, you know, forecasting the exact location and magnitude of some, some of these warm air intrusions. And they also failed to detect um, the transition, the thermodynamic phase transition as the air mass made it into, you know, the higher latitudes. And they made several tweaks in their model parameterizations and basically nudged, not just nudged the model, but made, made changes in the model architecture itself, um, specifically with regard to these interaction processes. And it it then was able to capture things much better. Another example would be, you know, their parameterization. Oh, this is now, sorry, not the, uh, the weather forecast model, but one of the climate models, the participating climate models, where they completely changed the parameterization of the broadband surface albedo, and that then fed back into some of the process parameterizations in there. So this has to happen in the context of model predictions. And this is where the ARCSIX investigation as a whole falls short because, you know, it didn't have the funds to get all of these modelers involved, but we need modeling to actually put the measurements and the remote sensing into context. So I can't emphasize enough how important mm -hmm. talks like this one will be in the future. Um, to connect to the wider community and get them involved. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. We'll be. I'm a modeler. I'd be glad. To, I know how long <laughs> to get engaged and. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, you're 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 going to be very much a desired science team <laughs> member, how yeah. long? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, that conversation kind of led me to my sort of question, Sebastian, that I'll pose. But let me add to what you said, which is. I think one thing you didn't uh, have a chance to talk about are the Lagrangian uh, experiments uh, where we're going to try to, uh, when we have warm air intrusions, to kind of, you know, chase the air parcels and track and resample them. I think that'll be important. That kind of uh, flight track approach will be important to getting two way interactions. And then you touched on it at the end, which is, I think we're really not going to, I don't think you can. 
I'll think more on this. I don't think you can really get at two way interactions without invoking a model. I'm not sure we can really do it with observations without being able to, you know, have a model to be able to, you know, quote unquote, turn off some some physics and see how the, the simulation changes those types of experiments. So I think it's really hard or maybe impossible potentially to get at true two way interactions obser from observations alone. So I think, you know, part of the strategy is to have observations and this was this is was in the deliberations before the white paper. It may or may not be in the white paper, but definitely going to have uh, the observations we're taking are and choices that were made to prioritize observations were to drive model simulations after the fact. Yeah. So and, then, and oh, sorry, go ahead. So my question, and then you can start with this because I think so. Could you talk more about where models modeling was or was not funded, and how modeling fits in more, more generally? Yeah, probably the the the. There are several pieces here. Of course, there's the the climate model piece. There is the you know NWP piece, and then there is LES and actual process models. And if you ask me personally, I think that um, I think that the NWP is you know community is fairly well represented because we have Amy Solomon as our lead forecaster, who is also very interested in advancing her zoo of um, models. She also works with LES, of course. Uh, the climate modeling and, you know, Patrick, you're the only one right now who is basically living in this community. But my personal feeling is that when we're talking about Lagrangian experiments, um, you cannot really do this well without um, heavy uh, LES, uh, LES um experiments or studies that that fly along because you know of course the air mass trans transport is one thing but the modification of the cloud systems and the transitions that are happening are another and i saw this firsthand now in you know in sweden they actually had several les groups sitting there and they had their their models not running in, in, in real time, but a few days later, they actually had LES simulations that followed the aircraft. So there was a domain that followed the aircraft along and they were able to really model these, these cloud fields. Not only that, in some cases, they even did this as a flight planning tool and they, they ran LES beforehand and then they, you know, with with the estimated, you know, with the estimated uh, forecast of the, you know, the, the fields for initialization. And then they had the aircraft fly through that and do their flight planning that way. In my view, something like these Lagrangian LES exercises, like the stuff that um, Jan Kaziel did in the Atlantic or um, that maybe Anne Fridland would would bring or would have brought if she had been funded. Something like that is really, really missing if we want to make progress uh, in this direction. And that's all I can tell you, Patrick. Um, uh, I think we even agree on that piece, right? I'm, I'm not sure how you feel. No, I, I agree. And I just, something I've said before that I'll, I'll say again, there in, in the planning of this experiment and the conversations that we had, the view that's taken, and this isn't just the folks we're working at with now at headquarters, but it's it's actually sort of a NASA perspective that the panel, I'd love the panel to, to be, be aware of moving forward is that, you know, kind of the idea in how flight most, uh, sort of directed or headquarters funded, not the, not the, like, Earth venture suborbital like PI led experiments, but the kind of NASA headquarters sort of funded experiments, directed experiments, uh, is that it's the view is that modeling is kind of like something that we'll fund after we get the data, right? Mm -hmm. you, the first step of the solicitation process is we're going to go ahead and fund to get, we're going to get this data because the most important thing is to get the data and we're going to sacrifice modeling to inform flight planning at the expense of, in order to get more data, right? That's the view. And that when, right. after the data is collected, there'll be a second call to come out with do science with that data. And then in that call, we'll fund modelers to do all kinds of science. Mm -hmm. So there's this kind of two piece approach that, that 
came clear to me throughout this process that NASA kind of in, uh, you know, implements that kind of separates the observation taking from the modeling. But I know in conversations that Sebastian and I have had, and, and it showed up in the white paper for sure that we, we feel differently that that the modeling really needs to inform it certainly the modeling informed what's in the white paper and informs our thinking but we feel like the modeling should be much more involved in the flight planning um than than it was i, I don't want to use the word allowed but but then it is based upon the funded science team yeah and i i again you know i saw this uh, absolutely patrick i we we called this uh, back when we developed this that Arc six is going to be the first mission where the modeling and the observations um, are going to be fully integrated. Um, you know, we 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 wanted this, but then of course we went back. You know, it's understandable because resources are limited at, at NASA, so we had to scale back the modeling piece. And then, uh, you know, now we're we're trying to maybe get that back in some fashion. But the question is how. And I saw firsthand how it really works when modeling and observations are are integrated. The flight planning, as you said, Patrick, it just works differently. You know, the, the modelers would sometimes organize a flight to, to get certain things done. But we're dealing with the realities, of course, you know, the funding realities. I'm, I'm seeing a parallel evolution right now for AOS, where, you know, for all of this new you know, these new observations, they're in many ways working with the same old heritage algorithms and just re-implementing them rather than, you know, truly pushing science forward. Again, understandable, understandable but um, the I think the only way we can work with this constructively is to say, well, we just have to involve as many, you know, um, as many researchers outside of the uh, observation takers and get them involved early on before they have to write their um, analysis proposals or even have them write proposals right now um, and and connect to the mission at this stage if at all possible because if that happens then they can drive the mission and they take home data that will benefit their projects that all sounds like a salesman right now. Um, I didn't want to leave that impression, but I think we need some external resources to make this to make this happen. Not saying that Arc Six won't be successful without that, but it will be more successful if we if we can tap some of these external ones. <clears throat> Mike, Mike, I, do you have? I raised raise my hand. Can I hop in here? It's related to the discussion. Absolutely. We just have. So, so I think this is um, kind of a really interesting opportunity here for the business panel. Um, so, as we've seen in the case of NOAA, they have taken the strategy for the pre uh, TPOS field campaign related modeling activities um, that they're they're investing in some of the modeling analysis up front, and this uh, new paradigm I think is a good one and one that we should be promoting with the other agencies. Um, and this panel can help do that. Um, I also think that uh, we have some of our panel members here, and I think Ming was able, Ming Zhao, you were able to join by phone. Um, it'd be interesting to hear, and, and uh, as well, we have um, Hailong here from PNNL. In terms of those um, modeling centers, right, like PNNL um, and and GFDL, and do we have anyone from NCAR on our membership list? I don't, I don't know that we do. But is there the ability to move beyond, say, the GFDL model, if if it's largely GMAO that's engaged at this stage? Um, how is it that we can um, engage these other centers more directly? Because the these topic, this topic is of very high relevance to the work of those modeling groups in those centers. And so I think um, how to build that bridge and the time frame here, there's an opportunity to kind of have an intervention <laughs> to really make a difference. And I think the panel can um, help play a role in that. So so can we hear um, Hailong and, um, and Ming? Yeah. 
uh, yeah, near. yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, uh, we're we're always personally, or I know, I understand the DOE programs, uh, the model mo model modeling projects. We're we're always interested in uh, collaborating with other uh, agencies and other PIs to get the Arctic, especially over the Arctic. So uh, observations are uh, we're so lack of. Uh, Observations, yeah, we we I I'm I'm a co-PI on a, a DOE project that focuses on the Arctic called HILAT. Um, so we 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 study processes and at uh, at smaller scales and uh, longer uh, uh, scales. Um, yeah, so we 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 don't we we have the funding support. We can def we can definitely if if it's, there's opportunity to get uh, engaged earlier. Uh, I'm definitely interested, in, and and also I I think it's a great idea to engage modelers uh, earlier. I mean, there are some field campaigns they even uh, organize a like a pre pre campaign model in the comparison to see some deficiencies or uh, potential improvements that the campaign can help. That that's also a possibility, uh, especially given the mosaic now. There there, there will be a the second mosaic uh, uh, science meeting next February. There might be lots of modelers like uh, uh, use what we learned from mosaic to 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 guide maybe uh, uh, observational strategy or or what other uh, observations can be uh, collected during this uh, six week two three months long uh, field campaign that can help more. Yeah, I, I think that's a great idea. Ming, did you have it, um, anything to share? I think you're on the phone, so hopefully you can hear us. I know you had trouble joining. Um, are you there? Let's see, he's showing he's on mute. So you're on mute if you is can. It, is it still star six to unmute on the phone? Yeah. Still think? Yeah. So, um, so on this, yeah, just to pursue this, um, you know, maybe we should have a follow on conversation um, about um, how to get together, not only mind centers, but the agency programs who fund <laughs> modeling in this arena um, to see if there is interest in, you know, kind of spinning up something even ad hoc. Um, you know, there's a lot of funding available within the labs themselves. Um, it's not clear that other agencies will direct a call toward uh, a field campaign that's largely being mounted by one agency, although it'd be nice if that would change to, as well. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I think perhaps on this one, we should, we should see this as an opportunity for PISMIT to directly engage, come up with a forum of some sort where some dialogue um, of field campaigns like this that need this assistance in engaging the modeling activity, the modeling centers directly. Yes, I, I love that idea. Sebastian, I think we need to try to build a coalition of the willing of the modelers that, I, that are already absolutely. working and lever leverage those projects and already ongoing activities, I think, to kind of fill this gap that, that we have. I absolutely agree. And I, I think we can now that, um, you know, the decisions have been made, we can now take the initiative again and we can bring this to hell and to Torsten and say, you know, we know funding is limited, but, you know, let's at least make an effort to do this differently than has been done in the past. I really like that you talked about this paradigm change that effort is poured into modeling prior to taking new observations. I, I really love that approach. All right, we are pushing up against three o'clock, but if there are any other questions, we can thank you, Sebastian, for your presentation and the conversation.